Alternative 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. Now your host, Nick Nanavati. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Art of War podcast. I am your host, Nick Nanavati, and this week I am joined by one of my most favorite Warhammer players ever, Mark Perry. Mark, how you doing? What's up, guys? I'm here. I'm something. I'm not sure what I am, but I am a Mark and I'm a Perry. I don't I don't know how to carry this intro anymore. I've ever been passing the ball to Nick. Excellent. That is Mark Perry, everybody. He is one of our Art of War coaches. He is the meanest. He's the greenest. He's the nicest guy you'll ever meet in Warhammer, actually. And we're going to do a little bit of a different episode this week compared to what we usually do. Don't worry. Next week, we'll be back on track. We got Anthony Manila lined up to talk about world leaders and his philosophy about 40K. But today, we have Mark Perry and we're going to talk about Mark's history as a Warhammer player. And we're going to get into the fact that he has surrounded himself by some of the top players in the world. He's had a lot of success in his life. He's had top three at the GW US Open in New Orleans. He got top two at the Frontline Gaming event in New Orleans, the Super Majors. He's been on the World Team Championship for Team America. Really, really accomplished player. And we're going to talk about how sometimes he's got highs, sometimes he's got lows. The inconsistencies, the fact that real life gets in the way of your ability to keep up with the game and how you can keep up with it as you have different periods and episodes within your life. Ultimately, we're going to be getting to the fact that Mark's got an event coming up where he's going to be playing Chaos Demons, one of my favorriteest factions. And ultimately, we're going to be coaching him up on that to help him get ready for his event. Mark, are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm super excited. So this is not going to be our usual part one, part two episode. Normally, we'd have part two behind the paywall for our patrons. Typically, we will keep doing that. Don't you worry. But I think this episode is going to be chock full of super awesome information that I really want everyone to have access to. So, Mark, I'm really excited. Let's get into it. Tell me about yourself as a 40K player. Like, Give me a little background information. A little background information. Oh, no. Let me think here. I started playing in 2009. I was 14 years old, so I'll come in. You know, I'm at halfway of my life somehow now getting a little old, I think. Not sure, but started in the kind of the middle of fifth edition. And, you know, until I probably hit about like 20, like I was just, you know, I went to like local events when all these other things. It's always competitive, probably like actually like more of a meta chaser back then than I am nowadays. I'm not really a meta chaser nowadays because like I've developed my skills. But back then, it was probably definitely a lot more trying, a lot more like trying to learn the game, all this stuff. And, you know, I'm going to play what's best and what I can make work. And then 2015 rolls around and I have a life experience that really changes 40K and like what I want to like going forward with it, what I have goals, like things that happen. And that event is ATC, American Team Championships. First big event that had like more than like, you know, 30, 40 people. Uh, was like the highest I've ever been to, like went to like one or two two day events. But like ATC was like massive Went in there, saw all the different people. And it was just an eye opener. It was something I'm like, I really love this hobby. I want to do more of it. I really want to focus my attention on it. And I did just that. You know, I go over and I'm like, OK, cool. Well, I'm going to focus on this more is probably my main hobby at the moment versus like back in the day. I was more of a card game focus, always with war gaming on the side. A lot of times people have like a breakout event where they go to like a Warhammer RTT or a GT, typically something a little bit larger where they meet a lot of people, have an awesome experience, play five games of Warhammer in a weekend. And it it hooks them. Like, honestly, it happened to me. It happened to John. We had him on the last episode. It sounds like it happened to you, Mark, where you just go to a tournament and you're like, now I'm a Warhammer player. Yeah, that's that's like that was like not just a Warhammer player. That was like me. I'm like, I'm going to be a traveling, like actual, like I'm going to go to cons and I want to go to big things and not just be like a local, you know, local player. Right. I don't I want to travel out. What Uh, was it about that first ATC that really got you? I think it was just like the scale of it. The community of it was all great. Like talking, having games with all these different type of people, seeing different ways of playing and like the hobby also of everything about like the whole things of why like Warhammer as a as a game is so fascinating it's because we have this huge driven of we're trying to talk about high level play to like, you know, we play how I want to play because the game is so open. It's so free. You can express yourself in so many different ways as a game. 
why also, you know, you have this huge hobby aspect. You can talk to so many pe- random people about some of your favorite lore. You're going to see sentimental model pieces that people love. People ask you about your stuff and like it's so much engagement. It's so unique. And like I think like the gaming sphere for me for like it was just it was massive changing for that beforehand. Like I've always been a pretty like competitive guy and the fact that I, I just want to play like good, like, you know, like good, tough games. I enjoy a challenge and like a challenge is always to me was like something that moved forward in my life was like something came up in my life and I'm like, it challenged me. So I, I rose to the occasion. I always wanted to rise to it. So like my first game of 40 K actually was like in a tournament. I had a fourth edition uh, rule book because I couldn't like, I couldn't get a fifth edition one. got my hands on a fourth edition when I showed up to a random shop and I played and I had a good idea. Of my rule mechanics I've always been good at that type of stuff. And I literally went one, one and one at my first tournament, in my first free games of 40 K. Cause like I played, the best guy in the room, round one, I played a never good, really good guy that was helped teaching me and like really showing me. And I drew with him. I played another newbie that was like, you know, a month into the game. And like younger me, I was like, I'm like, I know how to do this. And I just, you know, I won the scrub match. You know, I got bottom tables. I was the I was the best at the bottom table. I think I love like, that. It's just it's such a cool story because I ask this question to basically everybody when mm-hmm. they come on the show these days. And they all have a similar story where they started out. And they sucked or they were okay. And, you know, they did a decent job. And now they're up here and they're winning super majors and, and winning majors and crushing them, these team events. And it just goes to show that really we all start at the same place in this hobby, which is not amazing. And we, anyone can do it. It's awesome. Right. No, it's absolutely right there. Anyone can do it. And if you want to put in the time and the, that's like, that's the thing about 40K. It's so cool about it is like, if you put in the time and the effort, it's always going to pay off. And it doesn't matter. Everyone doesn't have to follow the same lines of sinking. They can follow their own lines of sinking and get to similar places, which is so cool to me. For sure. So let's get a little bit more into the future. You know, years have passed. You joined Art of War with me and Siegs. You started to see some really awesome success competitively. And like I said, you you top three the GW US New Orleans Super Major. Then like one month later, top two to at Frontline Gaming's event. And then uh, you had some other major accomplishments in there as well. Right, Mark? So like, I think it's like different of like phases, like during that, during that 2020, was that 21 season really pushing hard because, you know, we're just coming back off of COVID lockdowns. I only started going to super majors right before, like right at the tail, like traveling to like ones that were like not in like five, six hour um, drives away and like actually getting on planes to go to the tournaments right before COVID hit. And I was, you know, I became like the, you know, I'm a local GT monster cool and then i wanted to go up to the next level and like then COVID happened we we all happened so you know art of war just exploded and going into that 2021 season it was my first real season i'm like okay cool i'm at a really high top of the game and orcs just dropped um which was pretty big so i want to go focus on that the first real big event during that year actually i had really big success was actually taking eldar to a list or to to the orlando event and, you know, I'm, I'm on top of the game. I have something I want to both prove, but also, you know, I want to do it. I just I'm just trying to push myself. Right. I'm trying to trying to see how far I can go with a lot of effort. Right. You're really trying to, if, if nothing else, win the IT season or as close as come as close as you can. Just put your best foot forward. Yeah. My goal during that thing wasn't even the windows. Like, I'm like, OK, cool. I've always been in like the top 20 years prior at the end of the season. I want to crack the top 10. That was like my goal was actually just crack the top 10. Because I haven't hit those stages like winning to me, like I always see everything in like steps, you know, I'm taking my steps up and I'm improving, right? I'm making sure I'm working on every single step that I'm going up. I'm not taking giant leaps because I'm a builder. I'm a I'm very much of an architect when it comes to that type of stuff. I want to make sure that my foundation, everything that I've built for myself and how I approach things is all in are all locked into whatever. And no, that makes perfect it. sense. What you're basically saying is like, don't focus on. A, if you're like trying to get in shape, don't focus on getting a six pack and losing 200 pounds. Focus on let's go for a walk every day. And then it evolves from there. Just one step in front of you. What are the goals for where you are right now? Cracking top 10 is a very next step kind of goal where I'm coming from, actually, and you're bringing out the coach in me. Do you have an overarching long term goal? Like, do you one day want to become the best player in the world, the ITC champion? Or are you just so focused on the what's right in front of you next goal. I think I'm right now really focused on whatever is right down in front of me because during 2018, I set a bunch of goals that I did not think were going to be, you know, I could achieve them. 
I thought they were going to take me a lot longer. And then somehow I achieved them. I hit a, I did a like out of like all those goals. I think there's like one that I haven't hit. And here I am. I achieved most of like my big goals that I was really fighting for and the challenges that I wanted to overcome. And now I'm at like this weird spot where I'm like, Hey, where am I at? You know, what am I, who am I as a 40 K player? And do I want to go higher? Or can, is a, am I settled here? Um, and, right. I mean, that, that's a bit of your life too, right? Like so many players are like, I wish I could go, uh, you know, chase the circuit and compete for ITC, but I'm out of a family. My job may not allow that kind of time off or whatever the reasons may be. Um, you know, everyone struggles with this to a degree. Mm-hmm. No, like totally. Like that's the thing is like, I, I'm, you know, that weird life, you know, midlife 40K crisis. Um, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good problem to have. Yeah. And um, I think it's an interesting problem to have because like it kind of shows with like, you know, some of my with some of my results at times where like it's really high, like I've been uh, up there, but but also sometimes I've just been at the lows. Right. It's like how much effort am I willing to put in? How much thought process will I put into answering questions in the game, the meta list matchups, you know, all the things beforehand. And right. I think that's an interesting thing, because like if you give me enough time, like one of my strengths is like if you tell me, I'm like, OK, cool, this is the homework assignment, figure it out, you know, and prep for it. Study the room. That is very much like what I'm very strong at is I am typically if you see me across like, you know, the years, I'm a very much of an anti meta builder or I will build something that's kind of mechanically broken, either some absurd combo list or a, you know, this very anti-meta list that has a lot of tools, that has a lot of situations that they can put your opponent in, but your opponent doesn't have the proper lines of how to engage with this and the multiple steps of the strategy they don't have into it. Versus where I run into the situation, I like to build myself an advantage because I know this matchup better than you do, and I know how to take advantage of those tools. And I try to make sure I study the room, definitely for pilots, you know, learn learn what a pilot's weak to because then I can build strategies based on certain players because I know their player tendencies. I'm not just fighting their list in my approach. I'm fighting like, you know, the person we, at the end of the day, there's a game inside the game. When this is comes to all games where, you know, you're, you're engaging with someone else, but it's not the way that you're engaging with them. The game that you're playing is literally just a rules of engagement. It is actually not, you know, a true test of like, I'm trying to sit there and say like, there's a person yeah. across the army. You're not playing against a computer. It's there's just a real decision making process you're playing against, and you can play their emotions as an example. You know, their how tired they are factors in. Their stamina is a whole factor yep. to these super majors that we go to. And I know you've struggled with that as well. Like you get physically tired by like Sunday, and it's harder to those are your hardest games. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Go, no, go ahead. I was going to say, what you got next for questions? Bring it. Well, I was going to say, this is something everyone struggles with, right? Their their stamina can, especially as people get older, you know. I remember Super Majors when I was 18 were not as hard as they are now physically, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> and then on top of that, like you said, life just accumulates at you. So like, how do you keep up? And then to what degree do you set your goals? These are all like personal philosophical questions. But more to like a, getting some value out of this episode kind of thing. What are some ways that you think, Mark, because you've been playing this game forever. You've had highs, you've had lows, like you said, and critically thinking here, what are some ways you can really keep sharp on the game, keep a beat on the meta maybe, or or keep some skills in your repertoire so that when you do have more time to apply yourself to 40K, you do go to that event, even though you haven't had practice games in a while or a good amount of practice games against quality people, you can still show up and if not win the thing, put up a really good show. So I think that is one, the first, like first way to apply to that would be, I am very much like, you know, if you're planning at a year of ants, if you're going to this event, I feel like it's like a super major. It's easy to plan for that. Um, Get yourself in good player habits, right? Make sure that, you know, you're doing basic homework um, daily. Doesn't even have to be about relevant 40 K. It could be about current 40 K, but you need to think about like positioning, and how you engage something, not so much in the mechanics of how you do it, but in the idea of how do you engage that in a positioning and a strategy game, right? Like in a strategic sense, like where are your win conditions? How do you achieve victory? Where do you put your units to do that? Right, exactly. How do you get your opponent to do things they don't want to do? How are you going to make uh, complicated positions on the board that regardless of mechanics, your opponent's going to be really split with simplifying, you know, 
the idea of that, you know, these are putting them in like a lose lose situation. Exactly. And I think a lot of that is one of my, you know, one of the things that always is good to do if you are overcomplicated the game, because I can easily overcomplicate every little micro thing into the game uh, and you can lose yourself into that. So that's one thing about teaching myself and coaching myself up for an event is make sure I'm like, I'm not overcomplicating things after going deep down a line of thinking and meditating on something passively, you know, across the day as I'm doing work tasks, as I'm driving, you know, I'm just asking myself questions and sometimes out loud. Uh, it's really good as a player habit. Ask yourself a question out loud because sometimes that question inside your head sounds really dumb to ask. But when you say it out loud, it makes a lot more sense. You know, something in your head just clicks correctly. And you, you say that out loud and you're like, no, that's there's a lot more to, to that. Art answers itself as you say it. Uh, One of the things I always say uh, when I help people who have limited time as a coach, I'm always like, you can practice without playing. You like what you're saying. Review games you've played in your head. Watch some 40K games as you have time. You can put video on your phone like literally any time these days. Yep. So there's there's ways you can add 40K to your life and keep it in your zone if you want to. And ultimately, that is a bit of what it takes. Like it's a, do you want to put that much time in conversation with yourself? But you really, if you want to succeed at the thing, it's a matter of time at this point. Exactly. And it's not even like, you know, you have to like put hardcore time where you need to be doing it as your whole, you know, main purpose. You could put this sub thing as like an extra tab in the back of your head, which you're thinking about. Just ask well, yourself absolutely. random questions yeah. at random moments, right? And, you know, spend a minute or two thinking about this and then get back to your task. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Or just, you know, you passively think about it, you know, at different points. Like I used to joke, like I won my super majors in the shower because that's where I deeply thought about Warhammer for quite some time. And, uh, you know, like wherever you go to think, it's what you should consume your thoughts with more here and things that surround it if you want to really excel at the game and get better, especially so if you're not able to just grind games over and over and over again. That and also surround yourself with a community, I would say, so you can have actual conversation. And for most people, this is an online community. So like Discord is your best friend. Yep. Those are definitely good tools there. I'm horrible at talking about people with the game online. That's just on like myself as being like, I'm just not as tech savvy for when it comes to chatting online with like, you know, what I do in real life doesn't allow it to sometimes happen. Second, like people type, you know, four times faster than I do as I'm trying to like fat finger uh, this poor little um, keyboard that's on my phone um, and so forth. And I mean, to each their own, Mark, old man, Brad, back when me and him were on Team America together, he would call me pretty much every single day for like an entire year to just chat over teams and stuff, you know, pick your medium yep. of communication. Exactly. And that's, that's one thing, phone calls there, you know, talking to folks, asking them sometimes questions. One thing that was um, when I used to prep myself for events, let's say during the phase where I was trying to be like, you know, I'm the GT crusher. I'm going to go five and zero, oh, get max points. That from first place mindset was actually a lot of those games was like, me and my mind, my, my mindset approaching them since I didn't have like, you know, probably like the most diverse and big community for it uh, of people to play test with. The few people I did, we would almost play like blitz games. We play really fast games and figure out, you know, lines that were like, obviously, this is wrong. You know, give us, you know, practically we can shove in like five games in like an hour or two because we're, our ideas were playing really simplified openers for the games in the first 15 minutes. And if that didn't work, OK, reset, you know. Very much like that card game mentality in my mind of how I play test is like I want fast openers. And once you figure out the beginning of the game and how the game should start off, the game kind of solves itself. But you got to figure out which track you're putting your list, your matchup, what track are you and your everything is going to be on before the game starts. And I think that's one thing that uh, you really ask yourself, you know, how am I approaching this game? How am I you know, playing? How am I how am I winning this game? But what I like to do for myself, and I tell a lot of like clients to like people I'm just trying to help out better, is it's easy to ask yourself how you win the game. But ask yourself these other three questions, and then maybe, uh, not maybe, commonly, the common denominator between these three questions will tell you how you win the game. Ask yourself, how does your opponent win the game? How do they lose the game? And how do you lose the game? And a common denominator between all three of those typically will tell you how you need to win the game in the most simplest and easiest way that doesn't require as much stress and probably as much thought process. Those are great questions, like for a very, but on a philosophical level, but also on a very real level. Like 
in every single turn of the game, I do a little bit of a points projection or, uh, you know, some head math calculation about how the scoreboard is going. What are the ebbs and flows of the game? And I try to figure out how do I not just win the game? How do I lose the game? Do I lose the game by stepping out from behind my walls to go kill some tanks? You know, maybe I'll do some damage, but given my position on the scoreboard. So absolutely. Like it's a yin and yang winning and losing. It's, it's a give and take a lot of time, unless you just jam all your stuff across the table and really simplify the game down to a quick and check all stats check. But that's only one way to approach 40k. Exactly. And I think that's one thing that will like, you know, learning how to approach those different ways of 40k is a skill that everyone should probably focus on. Like if you are worried about like mastering out this list or like trying to get really good uh, with this faction and do all those different ways. What I would say is like try to focus on all these different approaches to how you play the game that are pretty generic and learn all of them and also then learn the ideas and the theories behind them. And it's harder to find that stuff in 40k per se, but a lot of the stuff from other games and the mindset carries over. You know, there's obviously you know things in like chess that will teach you in positioning uh that carry over in 40k greatly, you know, controlling the center, making sure your pieces are you know, overlapping to protect yourself as much as possible and um, so forth. Like there's so much different ways that other games have things to help out um, with a said play style, you know, a way to play. I and, always, oh, sorry. I always talk about how when people are trying to identify their play styles, like if you have any game background knowledge from other games you played, are you an aggressive player? Do you play combo decks? Do you play aggro decks? Do you play stall decks? If you play card games? How do you play other miniature games, wherever you come from? Mm-hmm. And even if you don't have that kind of background knowledge, you know yourself as a person, hopefully. Are you an aggressive person? Do you avoid confrontation? This, these things translate to how you play 40K, I find. And if you can line up how you like to play 40K with an actual style of playing 40K and an army that complements it, it really it kind of feels like you're naturally flowing. Yep. And that type, once you figure out that type of style and skill, what happens is then you probably need a lot less homework if you just want to be good at the game, right? You don't have to be crunching in a huge amount of reps. Once you understand what you're good at, you can minimize, you know, how much homework you have to do. If you're, you know, if you're busy with work, you're crazy of all this stuff. As soon as you figure out the way that you see the game, regardless of how the skin that is the addition, the codexes and all that stuff, you understand how to play the game. One of the the best mantras for life is to focus on what you're good at and minimize what you're bad at, not try to correct the wrong here. I think that absolutely applies in Warhammer. You'll enjoy your game more if you play something the way you want to play it, and uh, it'll flow, and you'll have much better results. Yep. Like, my first GT that I won, uh, first time going 5-0 was 2017, the last weekend of 7th edition. Okay? And I won that event playing Control. I just literally just played, you know, Magnus Death Star Control. I picked apart people slowly. I how did I win my last game? I lost Magnus and I killed, I think, like five scouts, and that's it. And maybe, maybe like five regular dev squad, but I can't remember. But it was, you know, he has de- drop pod devs and he has a giant Death Star that you know all the, all the sneak chicken wiggles uh, added to that unit that you just like I can't touch it. Okay. So we literally just played a mission, and I'm like, okay, cool. You don't want to move forward to me. I'm going to move in a different way that's forward towards you, but not close enough that you hit me, and we just played this dance. And I understood that. I'm like, cool. All I need to do is make sure I'm in the right position at the turn, you know, end of turn five, six, or seven, because that's how the game worked back then. I knew how to win this game. And if I got in a position where, you know, if you ever came at me, there's a high chance that you just lose the game automatically. And, you know, positioning and learning how to just play, you know, really good control-based 40K that doesn't require violence. Um, that's the first time I ever won a GT when I play a style that was very opposite of my own nature and it allowed me, once I learned my opposite really well, it allowed me to understand as I played control more and more, I saw more and more ways constantly in the games, but I was playing, but I'm like, I know how someone could punish me. I know what beats me really badly. And I realized that, you know, even in the higher level 40 K players from all over the place that were playing something similar to me are playing lists that could beat me that were, you know, insanely good players. They did not know how to engage properly, right? They didn't know the right type of aggression to, you know, counter the control. And uh, that helped me become a better aggro player because I learned more and more at playing a high level control army. And uh, for that whole year, practically just playing control and knowing what to do 
to punish it because I've been on the opposite end of it. I know one extreme, so obviously I know what my counter is. Right, right. And for me personally, I find I really, I also gravitate towards control. My first success was with Flying Monster Demons, and I was playing control, my first big success. And then I played that for years, and I played variations of it for years. And I take that really defensive, very movement-centric style through like every army I play. So what I find is the foil to that, the natural counter is like a super aggro strategy, one that you actually use against me all the time, Mark, where you just create a really chaotic board state, jam it all up, and in a way, stat check me, but also it's just so pressurized that it really creates a crazy board state. That I struggle with that. So, and when I say I struggle with that, I mean not playing against. I struggle to understand it. I struggle to play with it. I struggle to figure out how it works or build lists like that, where it some comes so naturally to say you or other people who view the game from that light. How do you? Why do you think that is? What? Where is the disconnect in your mind? I think the disconnect is the difference is like. You know, you could always say that, you know, it's difference in lives and experiences and growing up that could help out, uh, you know, that could help detail and hand us to those. So, like, for me, um, probably one of the ways that I understood those games is, like, I had, I learned to grow, I grew up very fast, um, coming from a single mom and all that stuff. And I had to, you know, manage being, you know, responsible, fun. I had to micromanage a lot of stuff at a younger age versus like a lot of kids my age, all they had to do was worry about going to school and behaving and learning, you know, learning their basics, you know, just learning how to do stuff versus like, I was like trying to balance out chores, um, my own projects I want to do, taking care of my little brother, making sure, you know, my mom supported building my Legos, planning for that. And like, I got used to like a really complicated, chaotic life, but I learned how to manage it. Right. I learned to understand it and how to handle what people would say. This is a lot of moving pieces going on, but I, I was very comfortable with that, right? So I knew how to micromanage because it used to be like I would play board games with my mom and she's a very, was, you know, very gifted when it comes to, you know, my mind is very much coming from her side of the family. And um, I would multitask while I'm playing that game. I'm either building, you know, Lego kits, Gundam kits, uh, reading a book, playing another game against myself to fine tune. Like I would play Yukio with myself as I was playing a uh, Skippo with my mom because I was trying to fine tune this deck and its openers uh, with that. Now I've been doing that since like my entire life. I can think of as just, you know, how I'm wired and like I was, you know, practically learning how to manage that, I guess. At the end of the day, it was, you know, self understanding and discovery and understanding these are, these are my strengths. Play that, but also learn, you learn your weaknesses, right? If you learn your weaknesses and you understand your weaknesses, you're less prone to them because you know what's not naturally a strength as so much as you can bring up that skill. Well, to just bring it back, and I like your story there, but just to bring it back to 40K a little bit, the example I'm giving is that I'm naturally a very defensive, conservative, sit in the corner, as we call it, kind of player. And I struggle to play something super aggressive because that's like my opposite. Mm -hmm. For you, you actually define yourself as like a control player. Um, and you said that's like your first thing that you did real well with. And I've seen you do well with that style. But then when I watch you just play games on like the day and day and like whatever random stream game or let's go to a small tournament, whatever. And you're like slamming people down with these like bashy pants orcs, these drop pods in their deployment zone, turn one, take them behind enemy lines. It, like it, it's almost a total opposite in approach. And I feel like you from outside looking in, you prefer to play in that capacity so what is that's what i'm trying to understand like you call yourself a successful control player and then you play this aggro style so it's a difference of like let's say you're passive control okay i am very much of a proactive control i will help control my opponent by making decisions for them and positions in the game right i'm doing what i want to do and not giving you many options to do things my thing is for proactively making decisions for my opponents by, you know, I'm forcing them to deal with this. And this is going to put them in a position where my next move will counter that. You know, we're, we're tra trading blows for moments, but I'm controlling, you know, how you're you know, like how you're like countering me and how you're fighting back uh, because I am initiating fights and then making you do things that you don't want to do what I want you to do. Right. So, you know, one thing is. Sometimes, you know, I have no problem sacrificing models because if you can think of the board state correctly in the matchup, you don't need models to be on board typically to win 40k game. And this was very true for like, let's say orcs, you know, figuring out that goth pressure and the whole lines of sinking 
uh, back in 2021, you know, I had to make a decisions for my opponent because I wasn't going to allow them to make decisions. And how did I do that? Well, I just engaged every single their army that I could. So the yeah, idea it's is about like, limiting their ability to engage you effectively. Exactly. I'm controlling them because I'm making them do things that they don't want to do. So, right, so things that almost, they would not normally put themselves in these positions, but I'm putting them into these positions so they don't have a decision. Yeah, I love the way you phrased it earlier, and I didn't quite understand it, but now I think I got it. You, you, you called it an aggressive control as opposed to my passive control. So right, I'll proactive. use proactive. Okay. So I'll use like, and I like that word, it's a better word. I'll use my jet bikes to move block somebody so they cannot come forward and get line of sight to me while I'm passively scoring. And that's kind of like how I play Eldar as an example. And you're saying orcs, and orcs do this army, but you will try to apply this with a lot of your armies. They move forward and try to engage the enemy and shut down their ability to counterattack effectively so that you're proactively controlling what they can do back to you. Exactly. Like if I know my opponent has to, you know, roll like, let's say this is a simplified like weird position where you're like, hey, look, uh, I need to roll an advance roll to get on this objective. You have multiple ways to handle that. You know, if your opponent has to run on top of this objective, you can either one, your approach is like, I'm going to body block you by like not putting, like you're going to layer models around the objective where I can't walk on the objective, right? That's a more passive thing to do, okay? Where I will look at that position, I'm like, okay, well, you can't make an advance roll on the objective if you're all in combat. I made the decision for you, but it's a little bit more proactive because I have put you in combat, so you can't even run backwards effectively. You can't even advance backwards. Right. I am limiting right. their decisions uh, and trying to force them down an avenue versus you are like, you know, li- limiting one decision and taking down out the window and letting them make decisions that are with a lot more freedom per se, where I'm trying to like control their room to breathe and, you know, how many decisions they can make. Right. Like the difference is I don't care what you're doing. I'm just going to stop you from doing the thing that I don't want you to do. After that, you can do whatever you want. And that's what I'm, that's how I kind of view it. Like I don't try to account for every single thing my opponent can possibly do and stop it. I figure out what I want to do in this game. And then I prevent my opponent from getting in my way. And hopefully that delivers me a win and I have to get creative when it doesn't. And it's yours coming at it right from the get go of, I need to contain what my opponent can do so they don't get to do stuff. Exactly. I am preoccupying them with too much stuff to deal with. Right, right. So one of the challenges that I fundamentally just can't accept, like as a person, I find that like when you play these, let's call them proactive play styles, you're deploying yourself like on the line in a lot of cases very aggressively. And if you go second, you're just at the mercy of your opponent. You know, if it's really powerful shooting, probably have already lost. If it's some other army that tries to move around and do combat, you're probably okay. But, you know, it's a bit of a coin flip in terms of matchup, if we're being realistic here, at least from my perspective. Is that just something you come to terms with yourself as a player? And if you hit the hard counter, you hit the hard counter? Or is it, is there more to it that I'm just not seeing? So you've seen it very much sometimes where I will swoop swap my play style to very passive. And those are moments when I know that one, either I don't have the proper lines of how to approach this matchup. I don't know the proper way to deploy. There's a lot of these random questions that I mentioned earlier, that I haven't asked myself or I just have not. I've done like the first step and realized it doesn't work, but I haven't gone to step two and try to rebuild it. Right. I haven't approached it uh, enough times um, mentally in my head and like forgot the game. But then when I do feel like where people like a lot of times I've had people where like, you know, I didn't have no fear and they're like, I feel like I just, you know, you've had that moment. You've, you've played games against me where you were actually a little bit more on the proactive. Like, I think I can just kill him and you change your strategy um, up from being a passive control to like, I'm going to punish Mark immediately. And I scrapped it out because like I understood that, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not scared about losing all these models. It's a timing effort, but also if they're so busy sometimes getting it's easy for people to get distracted with killing uh, that they lose track of the mission and you know you can win this game by w- winning you can win this game by controlling 60 percent of the game length you don't have to control 100 percent of the length the, the table space you mean the table space but also the game turns let's say that you know we have five turns in the game if i control the first three turns of the game and i can max out everything i can get in those turns um and i can practically like you know practically put you know it's like 
orcs. Right. Uh, if you play the first three turns and you score 90 points in the first three turns and your opponent is on the back foot, they're barely scoring anything, they scored like 20, and then you get tabled. Yep. They can score whatever they like, bottom of turn five, who cares? They're going to score a ton in the back half. Yep. But it may not end up to be more than 95. Exactly, because their strategy sometimes is going to be, am I playing, am, are they going to try to, you know, tie out for like five turns? Are they going to try to win, you know, win four turns? And that's how they're going to win the game. Are they also trying to play by controlling three of the turns? And if they don't control three of the turns, then they just, you know, also they just lose. And I never thought about things. it in terms of that, but that's you and John both said something really interesting about that, actually. John said the way he plays, he likes to backload his strategy and score all of his points in turns three, four, and five. I just try to score points throughout the game. You know, I don't really care so much where they come from. Oh, if there's more points to be found on a certain turn, I'll find them. But that's really my approach to it. Whereas you guys really take the timing and approach of the actual game into account when formulating your strategy. Exactly. Like John is a, John is a, try to sit there and say, like you said, he's trying to win on the back half of the game. So his terms of like where he's trying to make sure is he's not just losing in the first two turns of the game. So he's set up for his push in the late game where I am trying to make sure that I, you know, I immediately get my first step of momentum going and I can try to win it in the first three turns of the game. In a lot of places, those are where like, I'm really good at that because, you know, I've practiced for a while. I've had a long discussion on theory. How you do you properly run at your opponent? And it's all about maximizing your early game and your deployment and your overall steps and strategy. You know, what is your turn one wave? What is your turn two wave? You know, survivals of the what's it called? You know, your survival pieces, whatever pieces are alive that survive to turn three, that's what you get the rest of your points. What we're ultimately describing really is tempo. Exactly. Tempo. And you've probably heard me talk about this multiple times on podcasts to uh, random coach games or all this type of stuff is tempo, momentum, getting the pace that you're playing the game at figured out. Because if you can keep, get, if you can get the ball rolling with your point scoring machines and you keep rolling, uh, you're in a really good spot. You're just you're making decisions that are not too stressful to think about. You can easily find answers for them. You don't need to spend like five minutes on the clock and you know don't lose on it. You know, like I'm trying to say lose. Oh, uh, like you don't have hard questions to ask yourself. Everything that you're doing is pretty obvious and pretty like you know pretty open for like this is the correct path. Um, you're making it complicated somehow to make it simpler because you're overstressing your opponent. Like our people see complicated board states. I see it like, okay, all the rest is this is distractions. This is like, you know, setting it for later turns or something along those lines. But at the moment, one or two things only really matter. And pacing for that is really important. And definitely for me as a play style. So let's transition this talk just a, a bit and go straight to kind of the end of the conversation where we're going to talk about the fact that you're going to play demons, my most favorite astronomy at an upcoming tournament that you're going to. And the reason you're talking about playing demons is because you're dissecting the terrain format. What, what is the breakdown for the terrain again, that makes you want to play demons and why? So one thing is it's player place terrain. Okay. You're getting three pretty decent sized ruin or two really decent sized ruins that don't have windows at the bottom. And then uh, you're getting one giant ruin. That's like 10 inches tall or something like that. Tall enough. It blocks all greater demons and monsters. So it'll block on its side to like a bloodthirster or something. Yeah. Like if you can hide fate weaver and a bloodthirster behind a ruin for two turns or three turns or whole five turns, if your opponent never forces the interaction, that's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, no, I'm with that. So a couple of ruins so I can hide plague bears and whatever on objectives. And then thirsters not getting shot. Life is easy mode. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I'm prepping it for, you know, poss most likely that I would take demons to here. It's like, you know, my free approaches to this event was I'm taking eaters, I'm taking slash demons, or I'm taking your generic, you know, uh, double or triple monster mash builds. Um, and, you know, one, I still, I really love my eaters, uh, have not got as many events with them as I wanted to. Recent times, been busy with life and the balance, you know, that's the thing. Uh, I'm... I'm casually competitive is the best way to put it. Uh, that's that's the thumbnail for this video. Casually competitive. Um, and, you know, that feels good, but it doesn't have answers for every scene in the game. There's still a few, like, the demon matchup is, like, you know, at times really hard for eaters because, like, if you get a hammer and anvil and you can't escape the bloodfirster, if you can't run away from the bloodfirster, there's problems. And timing and pacing for that, uh, 
when those windows that you can have that happen, it's just, you know, it's very, very hard. Definitely with this event coming up, it's eight rounds. And demons, I want them. I've played with them casually back and forth, and I'm like, this is a good thing to do because, like, I can win a lot of games pretty easily. I don't need I, I don't need as much proactive. I can go back to some of the more... I'd learn the passive control routes. I can play passive control probably 60% of the games, you know, or whatever, six of the eight games. So that's 60% of all. I don't even know the ratios for that right now. Brain farts, dumb. Um, but I can play a lot of easy games and get up there versus like eaters. Typically, they need a proactive and understanding. You need to play five turns with eaters to win. You know, that's that's really one of the big things on like, a lot of like, you know, good play versus good players and really high players is those are like, that's how that codex needs to play. It doesn't have just always easy games. One thing, though, I will caution you, Mark, is is that the the demons I found are very much a reps army. It took me a lot of reps to get pretty good success with demons. And that's really the challenges. Like you don't have many units and they do very few things. You operate mostly in movement and charging. And, and you know how to play that stuff. But the way you play that stuff is by understanding when to apply what. And a large part of that is figuring it out through repetition. And then the added layer of complexity that the warp storm gives is actually really that plus deep strike, you know, manifestation, like your ability to do I send, spend all these warp storm points to reduce their leadership to try to create a six inch charge where I steal this objective and have a point. What happens if I failed that charge? The whole turn falls apart. Do I have a better alternative? Should I wait? These kind of larger strategic level pictures questions, those are where I think we need to focus on for this topic of conversation. Okay. So what is the way that I'm approaching up with demons? Um, well, that's really the question, right? Like what even is your list that you're thinking about? So going with this list, uh, you know, like you said, Scarbrand's a real rep piece. And like, I want to play Scarbrand. I love my Scarbrand. But he is a, you know, he is a hard piece to utilize correctly uh, without repetition, without, you know, playing all these different matchups and see the different ways that you play him and so forth, because he's a real high. He just has so many random abilities that, you know, sometimes the abilities actually going off doesn't matter. It's the fret of them and knowing when to project the fret of Scarbrand's potential versus actually asking Scarbrand to do Scarbrand things. Almost always, I bring, I put him in reserve every game, and he shows up basically on turn three. He might not even do much that game, like hit a charge off in the middle of nowhere, but he's affected the game a ton already. Hundred exactly. percent. Him just existing makes so many, you know, gives your opponent so many problems to solve. Because so like, another really cool trick you can do, Mark, just to make you a little demon privy, is you can take the warp storm and increase his aura range by three, so it's a nine inch aura, and he probably deep strikes closer than nine inches because of leadership. And then he can auto trap somebody without even making the charge. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's a great trick to know because like that. What is that? Three warp storms so modified leadership. Uh, it's three for minus one leadership. I think it's only two to extend your aura range. Ooh, didn't even realize that one. That one's that one's also really good to know. It's good for all kinds of things, but that's one of my favorite tricks. You combo that one actually. If you have five, you extend your aura range and an extra leadership negative. And then another trick you can do is. Let's say you don't have the ability to move a unit of fiends or something fast to within range of your opponent to reduce his leadership, and you want to for a variety of reasons like deep striking closer. You can take a unit of instrument, unit is the keyword, which is like demonettes, blood letters, blood crushers, whatever. That's an instrument, you're good. And take it from reserve, deep strike it nine inches away from your opponent the old-fashioned way. Increase the aura range for icon and instrument units. That's only two warp storm points, I believe. So it's even cheaper. And then they're actually both three to increase the three inches normally. So you save a warp storm point to get a nice cheaper leadership bomb off. That's cool. That's also really good to know for all kinds of stuff. Because like you also get like what was it? Uh, uh, seekers are being you know icon and uh, instrument units. And yep, seekers are. Yeah. <laughs> I use that against, I use that all the time. Like, the, that's the thing with demons. There's such a depth to it that it really it comes with reps and yeah. not even just reps, but really thinking and understanding it. Mm -hmm. And understanding the pace that they want to play and like realize they, I don't know, I, to me, demons are like the epitome of like what a control army is. And really, like, the idea that I think it's them and sisters are like the two of me that are the most control army in the game. 
because there's so many things that it's weird for demons being like demons. All their rules are either placement based or it's like weird auras uh, and they're really good at what they do. They don't have a lot of complicated rules. What they have is a lot of rules that are really generic, but are reliable. You know how to set them up. Right. And um, it's always interesting to me. I don't know. It's like I know what to do when I pick it up and start going with it. And then getting those repetitions, like you said, for like some of those more complicated matchups, understand um, is like, you know, decision points to like, where does the last like 500 points of your list go? You know? What I found with demons, and this is why I'm, I'm not super fussed on what your list actually is. Like you, you can take the trio, Scarbrand, Fate Weaver, Bloodthirster. I think that's a yeah. great foundation, especially with your terrain. After that, definitely run, I would say four troops is a healthy amount. I like two plague bears for the durability. And then you could run demon nets or blood letters or horrors for anti shooting tech. It's kind of different strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'd probably run blood letters, but honestly, 40 plate bears is really good too. Yeah. And then one of the things you need to consider is how you actually score points. Like if you're going to run Fate Weaver, Bloodthirst, or Scarbrand, Warp Ritual is looking rugged. You probably want another Psyker in there to help out. Your and banner. Yeah. Well, Transweaver is great for that. Your banner raising potential is pretty weak if you only have play bears as your troops. So maybe some faster units could be something. Who's yep. going to do it? Actions, all that stuff. Flame bears, um, you know, good thoughts right there is like, like you said earlier before, behind the scenes, you know, 12 inch moving fly is just a big, great thing to have from missions playing stuff. Three of Benvol from shooting, it can just tank and be a screen. Yep. I have that. I was thinking, you know, um, I'm back and forth with this terrain if I want the Seekers. I actually like the Seekers a lot. Um, for just like utility things and like body blockers. They're like just that's a massive footprint for not that many more points. It's only what 50 more points than a they met unit. Yes, it doesn't have obsec, but like you can you can they hit pretty good for what they when they need to go into certain things. And oh, uh, they're really good at body blocking a large section of board if you need to use them as a screen versus Damon that's like actual ability to screen out big hard positions is a little awkward because their base size you know you're on 25s versus you know the uh cavalry base it's a double-edged sword they can't move through walls and stuff like that they're not obsecs they don't contest as well there was like my game against adam there was the moment where i had like 10 demon that's or 10 seekers charge uh and obliterate a bunch of dudes on an, and not steal any objectives because they're not obsec and it was like this was kind of not what I needed, despite being awesome. Right. And I think that's the situation. I also do like what you said, like taking the idea of like, you know, 30, 40 Plague Bears. Sounds really tempting because I like the Plague Bear synergies with Scarbrand. Yeah. It just makes them a better monster. Plus one attack on Plague Bears actually slaps. The, yeah. I mean, I, I think Plague Bears are super underrated. Agreed. Like we, we talked about that back, like before LVO is like so happy about the Plague Bear because like, Right before you were doing stuff, I think you're, I can't remember what, it, you're at SUP then. And like, I actually was playing, I played a couple of games with Demons uh, during that uh, January. And I was playing with like, I want to say 10 or 20 Plague Bears in different games against like Guard, because like Guard were just finally starting to get their models. And like, I'm like, these things are just great. These things just sit and they do their stuff. And anyone that comes to skirmish with them really doesn't have a good time. And once he transhuman, it's like, it is not easy to kill these yeah. things. And like their AP2 in melee, which is perfect for just clearing out random shaft models, you know, trash Six models. Auto wound, it, like, they just hurt. Yeah, two attacks each, it's cool. Um, And with this terrain, I don't know, there's a lot of different thought processes. Like, you know, we know what the basic demon builds kind of look like, but it's figuring out, you know, what's your ratios? What are you taking for the homework project of this event? And that's like me trying to figure out you know, for this event in particular, what is the best ratios for some of these just really great demon units? You know, a lot of it is player pre preference with demons, too. I'm not that's, that's really, again, where I'm not focused so much on your list because, like, there isn't the demon list. Like, if you're running Mono Slanesh, you have four data sheets to choose from, so it kind of writes itself. Same with Mono Zinch. But if you're open to the entire codex that is demons, so much of your army wins off of the back of has the demon keyword and is a unit. And that just is applying the right stat line at the right place. Yep. Taking advantage of all the tools. And if anything, Mark, you're someone who can absolutely take advantage of the tools. I think that's going to wrap up our conversation for this week. I know everybody is disappointed. There is no part two to this episode. Mark and I may go back and do another part two to this conversation where we continue the topic, continue the demons and all that. Next week, we will be back. We got Anthony Vanilla coming on. We're going to learn about his philosophy as a hyper aggro player. 
Maybe it'll be similar to Mark's act proactive control. He's going to talk about world leaders. He's won a large tournament with them. Super excited to get him on the podcast. And then we got a whole bunch of teams content coming out after that in preparation for the Kansas City teams. A lot of exciting stuff on the horizon for the Yard of War podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Patrons, don't worry. We will be back. Stay classy. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Be brutal, but cutting kids. Remember, like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com.